Good afternoon, um, everybody. I guess actually hello, because um, I understand we are located on different time zone. And welcome to our round table. My name is Ayo Koli. Um, I'm joined uh, today by my two co-organizers for this event, professor and filmmaker Iyabo Kwayana and Dartmouth alum and visual artist Muhtara Yusuf. We have an exciting conversation ahead of us with our three guests. If you found yourself um, to this conversation today, I gather that you have read the bios of our guests on the flyer. So I will be very brief in my introductions of our guests. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome a filmmaker and science fiction writer, Wanuri Kahiyu, who is joining us from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm also pleased to welcome uh, African futurism uh, writer, Nedi Okorafor. Nedi is joining us from Chicago. And I'm also very pleased to welcome uh, film producer, um, Dayo Oguyemi. And Dayo, I believe you are joining us also from the East Coast, right? From New York. Okay. Um, I wanted also to take some time uh, to thank our sponsors, right? Um, this event was made possible by a number of units at Dartmouth coming together, the program in African and African-American studies, the program in comparative literature, the Dickey Center for International Understanding, the Ethics Institute, the Department of Film and Media Studies, the Hopkins Center, the Leslie Center for the Humanities, the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship, and the program in women, women's gender and sexuality um, studies. Um, this session will be recorded and we ask that you use the Q&A function to ask questions or enter comments uh, for your guests. We'll make sure to leave plenty of time uh, for Q&A. Uh, Iago will now get us started on uh, this conversation. Hi everyone. Um, we can't really begin this conversation about the narration of Black future without addressing where we are right now and how the power of narrative affects us. Considering the capricious nature of the present moment we are collectively experiencing and the power that narratives have had in shaping it, how has this specific moment impacted the way you think about the importance of narrative and storytelling? I have been using my time as a filmmaker to figure out how to have conversations about joy and how to make joy part of our everyday language and how we see images of ourselves in joy more often so that we can balance our own images in our heads of ourselves about how our relationship with it, whether or not we deserve it, um, and also in an effort to start creating our own specific kind of utopias. So if we were to talk about what our utopias look like, we have a, a, a firm understanding of that because we have many different narratives telling us about the possibilities of what it can be. And then we can start to inject ourselves into these possible futures or possible scenarios and possibly live now into our future. So that's the work that I'm really currently focused on doing, given our time period and our, and our here and now now. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to, to jump in, um, how, have, how have the, I guess, the current times affected the way that I view storytelling? I would say that, that the current times have not affected um, the way that I view and, and and practice storytelling at all. I think that that um, that storytelling's purpose is is it. Storytelling's purpose is to record, um, contextualize, uh, inspire, question, um, like push to push back. You know, and so all of those things, I mean, those go right into, right into um, the current time. Storytelling is doing what it needs to do, at least for me, like it, it's, that's, this is, this is when it's, it's um, 
uh, most important when it's it, it's functioning at its highest level. So I would say that 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 the way that I view storytelling is is not changed at all. If anything, it's become um, it's become strengthened. Like I mean, I, but I've always had I've, I've always understood the power and impact and necessity of storytelling. So so. Um, so I wouldn't say that that much much has really changed, but it's 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 definitely I, I think that that other that others may see the it, the importance of it even more so now than than ever um, with, with with all that has happened and that when I say all there's just so much I couldn't even especially in the last year worldwide um, and I, and I think that like like you know storytellers are recording this story like we, we've 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 really come to understand the necessity of storytelling and understanding what's going on in in our in our isolation in our fear all of that um storytelling has 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 really you know i i just i, I just want to like i don't want to say that it's become more important because it's always been important it's always been necessary right. i just think that like i think that more people are aware of its its need now than before yeah Wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I think Winery and, and, and Nady's perspectives are vital perspectives on this and are, are, are true perspectives that have uh, pervaded the function of storytelling over human history. Um, I think that, you know, um, both of them are right in the sense that, you know, we're at a point in time where um, changes in technology, changes in, um, you know, uh, in the modern era, the entire world experiencing certain things at the same time uh, and having the means to have conversations about these things in the same time, um, you know, just illustrate how vital storytelling is. And for me, you know, um, you know, there's the role of the storyteller um, to shape as shape and inspire as, um, as Nnedi and, and Wanuri have said, but for me, it's always, interesting, you know, I always think of a story as never being complete until it has an audience, until people have read it, watched it, you know, um, you know, like the, you, you complete the story when the listener um, takes it in and um, contextualizes it for themselves. And I think that's what's particularly interesting about this time when we are seeing, you know, digital media and social media enabling a what much wider variety of people um, than any other time in human history be able to contribute actively towards shaping um, the story and the narratives around what world we live in and, and its characteristics and for good and for bad as we've seen uh, variously in everywhere from you know the United States to Uganda uh, where you have uh, for to contested um, elections and political systems. So, yeah. So, um, a somewhat related question um, for the three of you. Um, the need to generate a new image of Africa, new stories of Africa, is at the center of your work as director, writer, producer. Yet, this notion of new image and imaginaries of Africa has a long lineage in both African cinema and literature. In fact, they are foundational to what we term African literature or African cinema. And I'm thinking here of the work and legacy of Usman Semben, uh, the so-called father of African cinema. I'm also thinking of the work and legacy of Chinua Achebe, um, again, the so-called father of African literature, and you may note that I'm quite emphatic and intentional in emphasizing um, those very masculine labels attached to African cinema and literature. And so how do you situate yourselves and the work you are doing within or against that lineage of African cinema, African literature, and African storytelling? Maybe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's it's. Um, I, I I I was like pausing on father of African literature, and um, it's something that I hear a lot. And whenever I hear it, I just I want to push back against it um, because there are. 
it's got that 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 patriarchal standpoint and I think about like all of my my influences like my biggest influences have been in African literature and they've been yes they've you know um uh Chinua Achebe is a you know a big influence I love I love his work but you know just as much as Chinua Achebe it's been Buchi Amichita and I know I'm mutilating that that's my accent but um, Flora Nwapa, um, Ben Okri, like all of these. So it's, it's, there are, um, there's, there are a plethora of, um, of, of uh, writers who I see as the, and e but even in saying the, the, the beginning of African literature, where is the beginning? Where is that beginning located? That's always something that I, that I pause at because if there's one thing that I notice um, being uh, being an, a Nigerian American writer, a black writer, an African writer, um, that we in the West in particular, and this is going a little off subject, but in the West in particular, we are always seen as constantly starting over, you know, when, when there's some kind of um, like a new, you know, uh, um, African futurism. There's a beginning to that, and there really is no beginning. It's all it's all connected to it's all African literature. So it's like we're constantly starting, shown as starting over, like we don't have a history, which always bugs me. Um, so back to the question, though, where do I uh, situate? Where, where do I view myself? And I, I just view myself as on that on that continuum. I'm part of um, I'm part of a continuum, um, and. Uh, in terms of the, the patriarchal aspect, I always view myself like for me as a writer, uh, as a storyteller, I'm adding, vo I'm adding my voice. I'm adding. So when I hear father of African literature, my first inclination is to add, vo you know, add other voices to, um, to, um, to really tell that story of African literature. Because I feel like, you know, when I hear the father of African literature, I feel like it's not there's an, that's not true. It's an untruth uh, because African literature doesn't just have a father and like a father does, means that there's the mother and who's the mother, like it's all that. So, um, but I, I see myself as adding to the, um, adding to the cacophony, you know, it's, it's, I, I feel like the, the voice, the voice of Africa, the voice of Africans, and, and I'm a diasporan, so, you know, I was born and raised in the United States, both of my parents, Nigerian. So I'm just, that's what I mean by I'm on this, this continuum. So there, this, this idea of the cacophony of voices, adding voices, that's what I see myself doing that I'm adding to that. And I think the, the necessity of having um, many voices is, is very important. Just to echo what uh, Nettie says, uh, this I, I, I also have a reaction to first anything, you know, um, first in anything is because we know that we are, like Nettie says, a lineage of storytellers. We know that those stories have, have, been, have been part of our, our lives for as long as we can remember. That's how we have our names, our names of stories in themselves. And the names are stories that have been reborn generation after generation after generation after generation. So whatever we, whenever we move forward, we pull our past with us through the way that we name, through the way that we speak, through the languages that we carry. We continue to bring our past with us, our stories with us. So there's no first. It's circular. Everything is circular. Everything is... Um, it's, it's, it's just part of this role of reciprocity that we're supposed to be following in theory. <laughs> so um, I, 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 I want to be, um, who, who knows what I was in a past life? <laughs> Maybe I stand here in all of my multiple genders in this lifetime, you know what I mean? So it's not, it's, it's um, while for, for what we've been hearing and what we know of our written history is that stories have been from men. We don't know what happened before that history. Were stories from women then? You know, I think that there's just so much more to investigate about how stories are told and how they come to us because in my experience, the primary storytellers in our houses are women. So our primary storytellers are women. So how, perhaps there's, 
I just have this idea of, of, of gendering stories, you know, that they come from one gender or another because it just, it creates this idea of a binary world when there is no thing, there are no, even balance has a fulcrum. There's no, it's, it doesn't take two things to balance. You have something in the middle holding it up. So it can't, you know what I mean? So we, we don't live in a binary world. So this forcings of stories to, it's just, it's so limiting yeah. when we have the ability to just be part of this flow of ideas and stories and creativity that is genderless and moving and huge and revolutionary in the way that it can be. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious about challenging the stories that I tell that are not limited to a shape or a box or, oh, she does this or she, you know what I mean? Um, just as a curiosity, as a storyteller and nothing else. And I have no idea if I answered your question. What do you think? Yeah, for me, a lot of this stuff, um, to me, ironically, illustrates the power of narratives even over the storytellers themselves, because Chino Achebe certainly never named himself the father of African literature, not, nor did Osman Sembene um, name himself the father of African cinema. And I think, you know, the, the fact that those narratives exist is in part, you know, a reflection of the political economy of publishing and the political economy of, um, of, of uh, film production, because you know, these are things that are, you know, African literature, uh, African cinema are things that critics and marketers, you know, use to characterize these things, you know, in the 50s and the 60s. It's a box. We put you in a box in your African literature. Um, some of Nettie's work is, I mean, it's amazing. It's brilliant. It's, you know, like, is it African literature? Yes, from a certain perspective. Is it um, interrogating future, um, you know, futurism? Yes, it is. You know, um, the, so many times we get placed in these boxes of, okay, this is African cinema. And then there are all these expectations that flow from that, that are really, the, the, you know, a handful of people who have watched a handful of films over maybe a two, you know, from 1960s, 70s, and 80s, who say, okay, well, we are the critics who have sat at Cannes or at Venice or at whatever, whatever film festival. We have, you know, in our wisdom, we have watched and characterized and categorized African cinema, and now we pronounce it this. And I think that, that you know, from the work that, you know, both Wanuri and, and Nadi are doing, I mean, it's, it's, a lot of it defies easy um, categorization. It's it's art, it's film, you know. And nobody sits around saying, you know, who's the father of French literature or who's the mother of American literature, because we understand and we we allow for the multiplicity of voices within those places. And 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 you know, and you notice I said French and American, right? And then when it comes to Africa, we take 54 countries and four, you know, uh, 500, 600 years of contact with the West, and we just put it into two boxes and say African. Um, so I think that, that the, you know, that reflection around the reality that the gatekeepers, the editors, the publishers, the producers, the people who green light projects, the, the, the people who typically take um, you know, permit the ideas and creativity to come out and decide who gets to see it, have been the ones pushing these narratives around what African literature is. And I think, you know, Wanuri's answer puts it really greatly, you know, it's like, if she's creating, and that creation she's doing isn't bound by somebody's preconceived notions of what it is, then I think that's revolutionary in itself. And it's necessary. Wonderful. So we just wanted to um, share the trailer of Rafiki, um, getting into the question of these this creation of new 
roads uh, of seeing cinema. Let's make a pact that we will never be like any of them down there. Instead, we're going to be something real. Yes, something real. Yeah. Yeah. And then the reason we to me Season of to kill him Doesn't she just look like a proper woman? Look at you. You're nothing. Some results are out. I get to be a doctor. Yes. I can get a scholarship. Yes. What's your name, MCA? What are you doing, Mama? What are you doing? Like in the ni shangaza. Kuna wa Kenya ambao kidogo wanaishtumu serikali. Kwa sababu ya msimamo wao wandoa ya jinsi ya moja. Just a typical Kenyan girl. Um, so to follow up on that beautiful trailer, um, I really want to kind of link back to Wanuri what you said earlier about creating a relationship to joy and to present utopias uh, within your work and thinking about that relationship to joy. And I'm hoping that you might talk to us a little bit about what that meant in the process of creating Rafiki, spe specifically as it relates to your choice of aesthetic, um, your choice of light and colorful and playful, sensitive uh, Afro bubblegum approach in the film. Um. I really just wanted to try and capture the feeling of Nairobi at the time, you know, which is not dour and uh, apologetic or uh, remorseful, right? Um, I wanted to create spaces where we see ourselves full of joy um, and trying to live our choices as best as we know how, right? Despite whatever the consequences are. And the quote that kept coming to mind when I was um, in the creation of the film is from a Lucille Clifton poem, which asks, what have you traveled towards more than your own safety? And this is a question that kept coming up uh, for the characters is what have they traveled towards more than their own safety? And that question could be asked of everybody and whether they did make the journey towards something more than their own safety or not, began to kind of uh, define who they were. Right, um, but I was curious about creating spaces where first that we have um, we have a hopeful ending. We have um, the ability to, to just leave space for a what if possibility, um, and and there's something that I love about that. I, there's something that I truly love about just creating that space of allowing a possibility to happen. And Nettie does it so well in all of her books. And she creates this space of like hopefulness where even in, in the middle of things that could be really hard, there's just, there's, there's, there's a seed of hope. There's a kernel of something that is, um, that, that allows us to imagine what could be next for us, you know? Um, yeah. And maybe, um, you know, as a follow up, if you could comment on making this film in Nairobi, uh, and as we know, I mean, same sex sexuality intimacy is, uh, has been criminalized in the context of Kenya. 
And so, you know, we know that in creating the film, there was also the creation of something that is not meant um, to happen there. Could you um, speak to us about that? Um, I think that I think that sometimes we think that things are harder than they seem because uh, we just made a film. You know what I mean? Uh, we got a license, we made a film, and then after we came back and we said, oh, look at the film we made, they said, oh, we didn't want you to make that kind of film, but if you change it, we'll allow you to have it. You know what I mean? So um, there's no... Uh, I think sometimes we, we want to hear the hardship of Africa, including like the hardship, how hard it was for me to make a film. It wasn't that hard. <laughs> I mean, it was as hard as productions can be, you know? Um, but I live in a country that has a really great uh, production presence. We have great skilled technicians. Um, and the thing that we tried to do that gave me so much joy in the, as part of the creation is that we tried to put women in every department. So we had on the first day, I remember, I walked on set and there was a woman carrying lights and I just like, I stopped, I truly stopped in my tracks because I just thought that was the most beautiful sight, you know? So creating spaces to empower women was part of the story of creating the film um, because it's, it's, it's important. It's important to see us, ourselves in, 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 every, in every spaces that we can, you know? Uh, because how we let, how can we create stories about these utopias and the places we want to live and be if we're not supporting it with the lifestyles that we live, you know? Um, so there has to be, there just, there has to be alignment in everything so that the story is part, is not part of a message or part of a belief system, but it's just part of a way of life and a way of, uh, as a way of living. And I truly don't, I mean, not that I don't believe in women's mentorship, but I remember being asked by a reporter or somebody, um, so do you think women should have, should have more, or could you talk to me about female mentorship or something like that? And I said, just give women jobs. We'll learn on the job the way men do. You know what I mean? And I'm a firm believer in that. So just creating spaces to just give in, to be given jobs, especially in the film industry. You only learn from doing. So create spaces so that people can try and fail because everybody does. Women don't try and fail more than men. You know what I mean? We just, we just not put in a position to try as much and to fail as much. Um, yeah, so that was the experience of, of, of making Rafiki. And Dio, um, how does that connect to the type of narratives um, that you wanna to bring to the forefront? Um, I think the, you know, one of the big challenges, or one of the biggest challenges about, you know, um, film production and TV production is um, finding the money. I mean, that's um, the, they're, they're, they're great, you know, it's sort of every step of the way in the process of taking an, a, a film or a TV production from idea to fruition is like climbing a mountain and then you scale the highest peak and then you've gotten there and that just opens the door for you to start at the bottom of another, um, you know, of another mountain. Um, but I think that especially in Africa and, you know, some of that is changing and for black folks uh, globally, uh, in the US as well. And that's changed and starting to change in the last five years. Um, but finding the money is a difficult thing. Um, when we, um, I think the conversations we had about, um, you know, under the Jambula tree, I feel like it was eight years ago, more. Um, you know, and, and, and just the different forms that even that production has taken to get to the journey. Um, and certainly not from the absence of ideas. Um, so for me, a lot of the question as a producer is how do we, you know, how do we get the opportunities that, that um, uh, you, you know, that, that our counterparts in other parts of the world um, from other, you know, other de demographics get, you know, to like Simone said, 
do the work, learn from doing the work, um, and and put our work out there. Um, and that's there's there's no question that some of the changes that are happening uh, in Hollywood and globally around diversity and inclusion are opening doors, and opening doors for different types of um, stories to come through. And I think very importantly for African film, for those stories to be made at scales and at budgets that have been almost unthinkable in the past. Um, and I think pushing on the envelope of what is possible at what scale, and not everything is about scale. Some of the most brilliant movies have been made on very small budgets, but, um, and then actually this is something that brings together the worlds of literature and cinema. Um, I, I grew up in the African Writers Series. Uh, my mother was a literature professor and I was always, you know, like these were writers who were family friends and, um, you know, books that I lived on. And I never ever thought about the African Writers Series as something that limited writers, but it did. You know, there's, if, you, if you go back and look through 200 books in the African Writers Series, they're all of a particular length. And that was, those were things that were commercially prescribed. And at the time that I read and loved those books, I didn't see that as a limitation. Um, but when you look at the books that started being published by African writers, um, both within the continent and outside the continent, after the Africa Writers Series, you know, the first crash of the Africa Writers Series, you, that's when Ben Okri went from writing 200 page books to writing the Famish Road and with, winning the Booker Prize. And not everything is about lens, just the same way that in film, not everything is about budget, but um, very many times there are these, you know, dimensions to how the industry work that are unspoken and invisible, but that end up shaping the types of narratives that we tell. And I think opening up that, opening up things from that side so that you know, um, a writer, a director can decide what story they want to tell without the limitation that, oh, well, you know, if, if you try and tell this type of story that can only be properly told with the $25 million budget, well, forget it because you're African and there are no films that have been made by Africans in Africa above this budget. Like removing that as a constraint. Um, and it may be odd to use you know, such a commercial film as Black Panther as an example of how even, you know, with, you know, a century of African-American filmmaking experience, these same things have affected African-American um, cinema. But I mean, Black Panther is a great example of that. You know, we're, um, in spite of this being a hugely commercial film, um, its significance is that it breaks some of the barriers that have been you know, things that have been narratives that have been ex accepted over decades as truisms within Hollywood are exploded all of, at, at once. And that opens the space for big and small um, projects to, to come through without this overhang of what is possible or what is expected. Thank you. Just to pivot back towards Rafiki, um, initially we were going to really have be in conversation um, with Dayo and Winery before bringing in Eddie. Um, so I'm spending a little bit more time with Rafiki. Um, in terms of your casting of um, the non-actors, uh, non Samantha and Sheila, Kenna and Ziki, how did you go about that process uh, of finding them? And when did you know? What was it about them that struck you that knew that, that you knew that you could use them to sustain this, this story amongst actors? Um, well, first, um, I think they were incredibly talented and incredibly committed to the telling the story. So they were gracious enough to kind of jump in, not knowing um, much about acting, especially for Samantha, who plays uh, Kenna. Um, Sheila, who plays Ziki, had had um, had had more acting experience, so she was more familiar with with what was happening. Um, but we just I used a lot of music. I used a lot of music in auditioning them. 
um, in creating relationships, in creating, in creating um, character arcs. I used a lot of music. So the first audition, we just played music and we had a whole room of women dance. And then depending on how they dance, whether they're self-conscious or not self-conscious, how they danced within their own space, we then whittled it down and were able to say, could you two dance together? And it was just that, and nobody knew what they were auditioning for, nobody read lines or anything. And then from that, <clears throat> we were able to call people back and then do very, uh, and do some line readings, you know? But even as we were crafting the relationships, we had music that was significant for like, what was the music you, um, what is the music you fell in love to? Like, what was your first dance? What was the music for your first dance? What was the music like in the middle of your relationship when you've settled in? What was the music for your breakup, you know? And then you're able to create a musical landscape for the artists or for the, um, for the talent that gave them their own journey through the film. And because music can be so personal you know, we remember when songs were played, we remember what associated emotions we have with songs. And so we created a sort of like a memory bank for them that they got to choose together, you know? So could you choose together which song is your first song? You know what I mean? Um, and even your breakup song could be different songs because not everybody has the same breakup song, but it was things like that that kept them solidified in moments. Um, and while we were creating that, we cre there was a very significant, there was a song that for me represented their, their, their relationship and their intimacy, and we used it to rehearse intimacy. And then later we played it as they were, while we were filming, just to create that mood again. So music was a large part of the creation of, the, um, of working with artists. Um, we're going to transition a bit to thinking about African futures specifically. So I'm going to play just a very short clip from Pumsi. Watching that, I think for those of us that are really um, familiar with um, with the film Pumzi and and also with Nedi's work, um, there's some really, you know, there's some resonances and themes between the two, and bet between Pumzi and and Nedi's work in futurism, which makes me want to ask about your collaborative efforts together, specifically about Wild Seed. Um, the collaborative effort between the two of you and Vi Viola Davis, um, three women from three different parts of the African diaspora, uh, to adapt this work of the late and great Octavia Butler. I'm wondering if you all could talk to us a bit about the forces that brought you together for this collaboration and what the Pan-Africanism in this work has meant for you. Yeah, um, well, for... First of all, like it was, it was Pumsy, Pumsy and Who Fears Death were, um, they came out in the same year. And like, like, we, so, so they were how we, we found each other. Um, it was really, it was really interesting because when, when Pumsy came out, 
I hadn't seen it. And I was asked to do this event at the DuSabo Museum in Chicago and um, to speak about Pumsy and Who Fears Death. And so when I did that event, that was when I got to watch the film for the first time. And I was blown away by it. Cause I was like, oh my God, you know, it, it's it, the, the parallels were, were striking. They were, they were utterly striking. And uh, it was the first time that I'd seen any kind of, um, um, that I'd seen African futurism in a film. Like that's, that was the first time ever. And then we've got women in the desert. We've got, we've got women who are like, who are, who are sacrificing for the, for their, for their people. I mean, the, the parallels were amazing. And so when I did this event, I knew I had to meet the director. I couldn't just do, I couldn't just speak. I was like, I need to speak to her. So like, that was really, the beginning of it and like once once we once we spoke it was an immediate instant connection and there's like a whole story of how we ended up meeting all over the world <laughs> it was just it was crazy but like so so that 2010 was was the beginning of that and then um with wild seed um when you can you can speak to how the book you know you know your connection to the book but for but for me uh wild seed is the Octavia Butler novel that it was first, like I've read all of her work but like it was the first one that I read and the reason I read it was interesting because I was at uh, um, the Clarion Writers Workshop and uh, which is this big six week long um, science fiction and fantasy kind of boot camp at Michigan State which Octavia happened to have taught before I was there you know um, so I was there that year and we went to the bookstore and when, when I went to the science fiction and fantasy section, I saw this book that where the, the cover was turned out. And, and it was the first time in the science fiction and fantasy section of literature where I saw a black person on the cover. That was why I bought the book. I saw it, I was like, whoa, what is this? I had no idea who Octavia Butler was. This was in like the year 2000, maybe 2001. And I bought the book and then I started reading it. And oh my God, I finished that thing in one night. It was the first, the first scene starts off with an Igbo woman in pre-colonial Nigeria named Anyangu. And I was like, oh my God, you know, it was just, it was just, uh, it, was, it was a big deal. We'll just put that, it was a big deal. Went on to read everything she'd ever written. So Wild Seed has always been special to me. And so when like, so when this opportunity to adapt the film and when Eric will speak about that um, came about, I knew it, it was, it was just, it was perfect. It was like the planets, the planets aligning. But <clears throat> I'll shut up. I'll let Winery talk. So I can go on and talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was it was similar. It was similar for me because nobody had ever spoken on my on my work on my, my behalf, right? So when when they said, "Oh, we're, we're, Pumzi is playing, but we're having somebody else do your Q and A," I was just. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this person? <laughs> so um, I really wanted to meet Nnedi. And then we met and then I read her book, Who Fears Death, obviously it was the first book. And it was just like, <laughs> what is this insanity? It was just like, it was such, it was such a wonderful like discovery. Um, and Nnedi is like my, like if, uh, I didn't have to explain this. Um, so I, if anybody ever asked me, what work would you like to do? The first answer was always, I'd like to do an adaptation of Octavia Butler's Wild Seed because I love that book. And it was, it was of all of her books, it's, it's like, it's been my favorite, you know? Um, I mean, long lived people through generations who love and hate each other. It's just like, there's so much that it's the most epic love story, love and hate story that exists you know um so when i was when i met viola's company and they said oh how who are you and what kind of work do you want to do oh i want to be da, 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 like that and they said oh that's viola's favorite book <laughs> and she really wants to try and do it so would you would you be interested in like writing it i was like yeah and they said so who would you would you do it by yourself i said no <laughs> with Nnedi, because <laughs> why would I not? Um, and, and then that's how it kind of came to, and then I had to be like, uh, Nnedi, I just uh, roped you into a... <laughs> 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 like, 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Heck yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> but I think that's also the nature of our relationship. I think people, we say yes on each other's behalf even before <laughs> we've checked in. <laughs> um but but it but it works um and uh yeah and it's been yeah yeah and that's where we are now and also let me add um to the the um the diaspora question one of the things that makes wild seed so special like it because it's because it 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 connects to me i see it as a connecting but it's it starts off in pre-colonial um nigeria africa and then with these, with these, and, and then of course, Doro, who's from, what is he from? He's from Kush, yeah. And, 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 and then, and both of these, both of these individuals are um, deeply people of the soil, even Doro, and they are long, like they are immortal and they travel across time and space, you know, and, 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 and being immortal, they're not dying, they're bringing everything with them. So it's like that, that, that is, you know, and so this idea of, of um, Viola Davis being African-American, me being Nigerian-American, Winuri being Kenyan, like, and, and all of us bringing, bringing this story together, bringing it to fruition, it, it makes it a very special project. It makes it a very, um, it's very potent. It's connecting and existing on so many levels. Yeah, and, and I, I'd love to say more, but I'd, then I'd be giving stuff away <laughs> about what, what we're working on. But that that definitely influences the the um, the, the creation we're we're producing called the the wild seed adaptation. Yeah, but and, also it just can it also brings into this. We don't believe it's magical realism either. We don't believe that it's something that's, you know what I mean, that's outside of ourselves. We really believe, we really think of it more as mythical realism, like things, our myths and our legends that we've carried. Because if you start looking into the stories about Doro or, or how Doro came to be, you'll find stories of children like Doro in many different, from many different parts of Africa. And you'll find stories about people who are shapeshifters. I grew up on stories about people who are shapeshifters. You know what I mean? So it's, it's been a part of our, our lineage and our stories and, and, and our, uh, the different creatures that have existed and, and, and beings that have existed in our, in our life and in, in our history. And being able to put that into this process is just a really beautiful thing. So you already hinted at it, but, um, and we don't want to belabor any uh, binaries, but in terms of African and Afri Afrofuturisms and your cultural origins, um, can you explore how your own upbringings have had an influence on the way that you um, see time or um, see story in terms of linearity? Yeah, I, th I think some of it is what I hinted at, which is uh, the first, the first, uh, the first ways that I see time is through line, is through names, truly. Um, and, and um, so we truly do give birth to our, to our ancestors, because when we name them, we're giving birth to our ancestors. So there, that is, that is very much in the ideas of time. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the primary part of storytelling. But for, for this particular project, it becomes even more pronounced because we're talking about people who are long lived. So they have a different idea of this, of what, of the trap that we fall into, which is the cycle of life and death, because we only know things to end and they see things as unending. You know, so they have a different relationship with what it means to be. And, um, and even in the way Anyawu takes on different identities and the identities she chooses to take on and the identities she absolutely refuses to take on are, are, are part of our, our own conversations with our own politics, but also uh, uh, histories that have continued to repeat themselves. Um, um, so I, I have a very, I don't know, I just, I see, I see time as a, a cyclical. 
Yeah, I, I see time is um, all, uh, it's non nonlinear. It's all mashed together affecting the, the past affects the future, the present affects the past, et cetera. Everything's, everything is influencing everything. And I, and I think about like, just even the way that I view um, science fiction, the way that I came to writing science fiction, you know, it wasn't from reading past science fiction, not at all. Like I, I didn't grow up reading a lot of science fiction because it just felt, uh, it felt very non-inclusive. It felt very cold and very white and male. Um, I came to writing science fiction from my trips to Nigeria, particularly the, the village in Emo State, like my, both of my parents' um, villages, uh, where I would see, especially as I grew older, because at first it was like going there was like just paradise. I would go, it was just like as kids, it was just, it was just paradise. It was just the best place, you know? Um, but as I grew older and began to understand, look around and understand the di the social dynamics and all the issues um, a lot better, I also started noticing technology, the presence of technology, and how it would pop up in places where there wasn't supposed to be any technology, like cell phones in like the deepest part of like a village where there's no running water or electricity, and, and you know it, where you know people have very little. Um, very little um, influence from outside, you know, and then you see cell phones popping up. And I, I was fascinated by that. And I, and, and, and like this, the idea of these advanced technologies coming to these places with very little infrastructure and kind of blending in perfectly. And there's like no conflict. So I, you know, I began to get obsessed about that, but that's, but that's really a manifestation of this idea of the past and the present and the future coexisting. So like, and, and so that's really how, like, so the very way that I see science fiction and see looking at the future, when I imagine, um, when I imagine futures in my stories, you know, you can see aspects of the, of the past that are futuristic, if that makes sense. I mean, you look at Binti. Um, Binti is Himba, and she's still pra she's practicing these old ways, but they're futuristic. You know, um, there's no, there's no, um, it's it's not rooted in time, if that makes sense. So, like, really, all of these things are just manifestations of how I view how I view time. It's very, um, I, it's cyclical, but even more com complicated than that. It's just all. Uh, affecting, it's affecting, it's affecting each other. It's not even makes sense, but you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It makes perfect sense. It's all interwoven. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Wanuri is, there is one question that if you have a chance um, that can, um, that someone has for you, I would love to hear about what drew you to once on this island and how directing a musical might connect to what you said about Black people seeing their joy on screen. Oh, that's easy. Um, Once on this island was one of my favorite musical pieces of musical theater growing up, right? I, like, I remember watching it the first time and just sobbing, like just like melting into the ground. And again, as, as somebody who just goes kind of, uh, it just, it, it sounds bad, but you who goes, who I, I kind of, when I, again, when I was asked, what other kinds of films would you like to make? Once on this island was at the top of my list, right? Um, and I've always been interested, just as somebody who's, who's, who loves islands, who loves living at the beach and living at the ocean and the mysticism of that, like when you go to Zanzibar and people talk about genies, you're just like, mm-hmm, yep, mm-hmm, yep, 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 I believe you. You know what I mean? You don't even doubt it for a second. And there's something about living in the ocean and the relationship with uh, um, just um, otherly beings that is so present. And, 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 and I wanted to be part of the storytelling of that because what if we created this island that drew from different influences, um, from some African maybe, some from some Caribbean. So what if once on this island had reggae in it? You know what I mean? Like what what would, you know, just, it's just, I just, I'm super curious about what the, the creation of that world can be. Um, and I, it's it's too early to say what would what will happen because the script is still 
being written, but it's just, it's oh. the beach, love, gods, it's, how can you say no? And the music. Utopia. Yeah, exactly, Utopia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Wanubi, I know you have to leave um, in three minutes. Um, it's been a pleasure having you. I hope I can just keep you for two more minutes because I wanted you um, to comment a little bit on uh, afro -Babol gum. Um, we've been talking a lot in class with our students about afro -Babol gum, about Afrofuturism, about African futurism. So if you can offer some comments about afro -Babol gum before we outro you. Yeah, I think... Um... I needed a way to define the kind of work that I want to do and the mission that I've put, that I have limited my life to, which is the creation of uh, fun, fierce and frivolous images of people of color. Um, and how we create spaces for people of color to be in joy, but also actively curate images of the past so that we remember that we come from a history of joy. It's not something that's new because there's, 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 whenever I talk about, or whenever I say, oh, here's joyous art, people think it's only modern art. So going into the history and finding um, fantastical or myths or uh, uh, the different ways our imaginations and, have, and our lives have intersected. Um, in joyous ways and not because we're doing it for ceremony or we're doing it for show or anything like that, but just because we exist and we've always existed as joyous people. So experiences of our past in history, experiences of our future in history and experiences of our present in history as demonstrated through art. And that's really what Afro Bubblegum is, is about. Thank you so much. Quickly wanted to acknowledge that, you know, we have a question from Hamza um, in the chat it's a question about, you know, strong Gikuyu influences um, that uh, Hamza picked up on, you know, on your work. And I acknowledge that you may not have time uh, to answer it, but I just wanted, wanted to bring that question to your attention. Well, in, in all my work? Uh, in in Pumzi, in Pumzi. Uh, Hamza is talking about Pumzi. Uh, yeah, I, I, there's, uh, there's definitely a conversation there. Um, First, the community is called the Maito community, which means mother in, in Kikuyu, mm -hmm. uh, but is made up of two words, ma, which means truth, and ito, which means ours, our truth. That's the word for mother, our truth. So if we were created by a community that, that considered themselves the keepers of that truth, how would they use it? Would they manipulate it? And if they were trying to keep the world safe, which is a bigger conversation about Pumzi, how would they do that? My mother did it through guilt and manipulation. <laughs> so that's what I put into the film. <laughs> so there's always a woman's voice saying, have you done your work? Have you done your, you know what I mean? And completely like manipulating through guilt, you know? Um, but also the Maito community, the council of elders was made up of three generations of, of, of women, which was the old and the young and, and, um, and the present and how they ruled as a council together, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, so, and also just like, uh, even the woman who helps her uh, is, 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 I knew that had to be a woman because women were in intimate spaces and they were sharing kindnesses. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a big, it was a big part of it, but really the conversation was about our relationship with mother nature, because if we come back to what Aikwe and Mar continuously harped on, which is reciprocity, right? If we're coming back to a world of reciprocity and we are supposed to be um, part of mother nature, and perhaps even we should, we should attempt to mother mother nature once in a while, then part of mothering comes sacrifice. And how much of ourselves are we willing to sacrifice to our environment so that we can truly live a, a, a life of reciprocity? And that's a conversation I was trying to have with in, in Pumzi. Thank you, Wanui. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Bless. Welcome. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And we'll bring you back. Inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Take care. So I, I wanted to um, also remind our audience that the Q&A function is available 
for questions. Uh, so feel free to enter your questions. We'll see your question and we'll read them and make sure that our guests uh, answer uh, all of your questions. Right? So I'll hand it over to Iabo um, and Muftaga, maybe. Um, Nedi, once I um, interviewed you and you were talking about the process or how you see, uh, how you create worlds. And that you said, some people might see pigeons. And when I see pigeons, I see a society of pigeons. <laughs> Can you talk about how you build worlds? And that might be too broad of a question, but what is your approach to creating characters and, and worlds? Yeah, um, most of my stories first start off with characters. And it, it's like, not just a not just like an idea of a character, I'm the type of writer who hears characters' voices. Like they speak to me. Um, Binti was nice. Onyesoma was not very nice. Phoenix was me. Like they, they speak to me, they're insistent. Um, you know, I, I, there's one time when I was writing the book of Phoenix where I tried, I was tired and I decided to take a nap and she came into my sleep and said, get up, I'm not done talking. And I got up and continued. So those are, that's how my stories start. I hear their voices. Um, the worlds, however, are, uh, I don't, I wouldn't say I build them as much as I'd say that I discover them. Because like I can, what, when I'm, when I want to get a feel for the world, I just go into the character and I literally look around. You know, I, I just look around. And, and that's how I understand the world. It's not like I, I write charts and, um, and maps. I don't do that. If I, if I do that, it would be like long after I've already created the world and I already see it. Um, so it's very much, I, I've al that's something I've always been good at even before, even before I started writing. I started writing when I was 20. Uh, even before that, I could always visualize places really well. Like I could imagine a place and I can move it 360 degrees. I've always been good with that. And so that's like, that's a skill that I use when I'm world building. So like in the world, in, in the world that I'm writing in, I will know details about that world that I don't even use in the story, like a ton of details. I'll know the history about the grasshopper that lives on that hill. I will know the whole thing. And it's just, you know, it, it, it happens over time. It happens as I write, because I don't outline at all. I just will just start writing a story and then it just comes. Um, it happens as I write and I'm able to hold it in my head, like completely. While I'm writing the while I'm writing the story, and then I'm able to put it down once I finish. That's why whenever oh, I finish the story, it's like uh, yeah, it is. It, I will say it is. It's, it's uh, but it can be also very heavy. So like I I don't I, my books take a long time to write, but when I finish, you will see me celebrating because it's I feel light because I put the world down for a second. Yeah. Just a quick follow up to that. How much of that, um, how is it developed over time? And do you have like rituals around writing that help support that? Or is it just like you're in this state of reverential attentiveness all the time, <laughs> like when you're writing a, a, a character so that you're paying attention to different things? Um, I think the, the world building aspect, that ability to see the world like that has, it's something I think I was either born with or I've always been doing, because I've always been a really imaginative kid, like always. So, so that's been there. Um, but over time with, with, with the writing of character, that has taken time. Like I, I wrote, um, before my first novel was published, I think I wrote either four or five novels before that, that like beginning, middle, end, edited, polished everything, I'd put them down and start another one. I wasn't really concerned about audience. I just liked writing. I liked storytelling and I wasn't thinking about getting published or anything. So then, you know, then eventually one of my professors suggested I should try to get a short story published. And then that was a whole, whole whatever. But over time, you know, I, I've kind of, uh, I've learned to trust my characters I've learned to trust them and that took time. That took um, just going through the process of storytelling over and over and over and over again. Because at first, like my characters would wanna do something that I did not want them to do and I couldn't let go. And I couldn't just 
I, I, it was it was difficult for me to keep myself out of it. It was very difficult. But over time, I learned to trust that process and kind of step back. So that was something that I had to learn. But like, I think a lot of the whole, a lot of the process in general was something that I've developed over time. I've done the writing, I've, I've written novels so many times and gone through that whole routine so many times that at this point, I'm, it's, it's intuitive. Like, I don't have to think too hard about, you know, how to structure this because it's just, I know how to do it. The story naturally falls into that shape, but I had, yeah, I had to learn it, yeah. But for those students listening, it was sort of a, an acquired practice that became stronger over time. Yes, yes, with a lot of a lot of um, just doing it over and over and over and over again. And and one thing that I would tell um, uh, new writers is not to be afraid to write something that's bad or that sucks. Like, don't be afraid to write something that's bad because sometimes you have to write the bad thing to get to to obtain the skills to write the good thing. You know, and there's no way around it. There's no writing book you can listen to, no lecture you can listen to, no lesson you can, you have to, you have to go through it, you know, and, and you have to be willing, willing to go through it, willing to take the time. Don't be in such a rush because a lot of this stuff really does, it takes time, it takes practice, and it just takes um, building up a certain, those muscles as well. Thank you. So Nedi, and I know, I mean, you may be tired of addressing this. I follow you on Twitter, by the way, and I always have a chuckle when I see you going after some random, you know, person who says, you know, Afrofuturism writer Nedi Okorafor, right? You are very insistent on situating yourself as a writer of African futurism, right? So could you comment on that and also think about, you know, just define uh, what, you know, your relationship to African futurism, why it's important to you. And also thinking about then the adaptation of Octavia Baker, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what does it mean to adapt it through uh, an African futurist lens? Okay, okay, that's a lot of questions. Um, let's see. Okay, okay, so there's a lot of, uh, yeah, so even this morning, I think I corrected. Yes, this morning on Instagram, I corrected somebody because I'm determined because I think it, it, it's something that I've realized probably in, it was right after I did my TED talk, I think, where I, I just came to understand that there was something that was not being understood. Um, and, and I think a general way to put it is that, that um, black writers of speculative fiction. Speculative fiction is an umbrella term for like basically any kind of literature that's weird. Everything just with something weird happening, be it science fiction, fantasy, horror, um, slipstream, whatever. There are many, you know, just the whole spectrum of, um, of I don't like saying non-realist because I think that uh, science fiction and fantasy can be realistic, quite realistic, but, um, but th that kind of literature. So I, you know, I, I, there's, I, I've come to understand that that black speculative fiction, when I say black, I mean black people of the world, global, like that's, that tends to be how I refer to black people. So when I say black people, I'm not just talking about a small group, I'm talking about everybody. But I, I've, I've come to understand that black speculative fiction writers are being viewed as a monolith so that they can be put under one category like clumped all together and in doing that we're reduced like all the the various um the 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 uh what's the word like um the variety of things that we're doing the variety of points of views that we're coming from are being reduced and it's all we're just being reduced to being black and what I, what I also noticed was that it's even more, especially in the United States where, I don't know, Americans tend to be very insular, very much like the rest of the world doesn't exist. So, so not only are we being reduced, we are being reduced to Americans. So like in the United States, and this is, and so like this issue represents a larger issue and it keeps getting me in trouble, but I'm just gonna get in trouble. I just, I'm just gonna talk, but like, um, you know, when you when you refer to a black person, they're often called an African-American. Like even if the person's a black Brit, 
you know, they're, they're called African American. And I'm like, why are you putting the word American onto somebody who has nothing to do with the United States? What is that doing? It's just very reductive, reductive. And it's kind of, um, um, and, and, and in doing that, you're not able to see the many different points of views. And the fact that that one area, like, or that one group of people, like, and I'm American, you know, I'm, I'm born and raised in the United States, but I don't represent everybody. And, and I don't, um, and we're a minority of black people on this, in this globe, and that's okay. So um, that's really, gosh, that's just like a general, <laughs> let's, let's shrink it back to the issue of Afrofuturism. I feel like Afrofuturism is, is, the, is the thing that's clumping all, all of us into one, under one category. You'll see, you see the word futurism, right? And Afrofuturism. And I've seen it explained, so I understand the definition. I just don't agree with it. But um, the, you, you'll see fantasy books put in Afrofuture, called Afrofuture, anything, basically anything that's Black speculative fiction. And so I just got to the point where, and, and, then I, and then I started seeing the definitions of Afrofuturism being it's only being that, it, that it's, a, a, um, it's only supposed to be for African Americans, like the descendants of the stolen Africans. So I, you know, and I was told that many times, there's one point, the point that made me decide to just create my own term was when like a thousand people came to me on Twitter when my name started trending on this topic um, saying Afrofuturism is ours, you know? And I haven't repeated this until now. I haven't repeated this because I didn't want to start trending again, but I'm going to just say it anyway, because it needs to be discussed. But like, it's ours. And it was basically saying that Afrofuturism belongs to um, African Americans by that definition. And this was around maybe just, it might have been before Black Panther or around Black Panther. And it's understood that Black, Black Panther represented a lot of money and a lot of opportunity. So people became very, um, very proprietary with it. So, um, so I'm hearing this a lot and I'm like, I'm fine with that. You know, that's cool. It just, it just alerted to me that, okay, this thing, because at one point I used to think that Afrofuturism was something that embraced everybody, but I came to understand that it didn't in that, when that happened. And so that was when I created the term African Futurism. And now I insist on African Futurism because what I'm writing is not that. And I'm not, it's not a knock on Afrofuturism at all. It's just that I'm not writing that and that should be okay, and that should be understood. And what I'm writing um, needs to be understood through that lens. So that lens means that when you look at remote control, for example, it should not be viewed through a lens of how does this story relate to the United States? The United States has nothing to do with remote control. Same with who fears death, you know, and that's okay. That's not a disrespect to anybody. And the fact that anyone would think that's disrespectful is very suspect to that person. So like, that's where the, the whole category um, issue, cause I'm, I'm, I don't write within categories. Like when I'm sitting down to write, I'm not thinking, oh, I'm gonna write science fiction today, or oh, this is a fantasy story. So let me write it like, I'm not thinking that. I write whatever comes. And so, so therefore like a lot, a lot of what I write doesn't fit in any category very easily because I'm not, I don't really care about categories. But in this case, I understood that for me to be read properly, it needs to, that, that term needs to, like, that term needs to be correct for me to, for people to understand what I'm writing. For example, with Binti, like, I had a lot of people asking me, or uh, assuming that the Himba people are not a real people, that there's someone I made up, as opposed to a real people. Okay, that's African futurism. If it's African futurism, you'll assume that most likely that ethnic group that I'm talking about is not made up. It's not made up. So these are things, these are things that are important. Now with Wild Seed, um, Octavia Butler's work is viewed as Afrofuturist. That is fine. I'm an African futurist, bring African futurist sensibilities to the story. Um, there have been some criticisms of, oh, you know, Nettie's a Nigerian American. Why should she write, or why should she adapt an, Afri an Afrofuturist narrative? And my response to that is, it's Wild Seed. Like, <laughs> do you know what Wild Seed is about? Like, 
okay, you don't go read the book and then come back and say that because Wild Seed starts off in pre-colonial Nigeria. It's the main character's name is Anyang. She's Igbo. I'm Igbo. But yeah, so that's my whole um, answer to your question. I Wonderful. I've hit everything. Okay, cool. <laughs> oh, amazing. Um, I want to... <laughs> I want to follow up that uh, that question and um, uh, ask you, Dayo, if and how the distinction between Afrofuturism and African futurism has come up in your work uh, in film. Um, it's it's interesting because you know, with your work as a producer, I mean, I guess for all film, you know the the, the life cycle from, hey, this is a great idea, let's make a film, to seeing something on screen can be, you know, can be two years, can be 10 years, can be longer. Um, and in that time period, so much changes, right? Um, people's, people's expectations on what, um, you know, what African film is or what African Afro Afrofuturism is or, um, African futures, and you know, like these, these are things that evolve over time. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, for, and I'll maybe I'll talk a little bit about specific projects that are that that are coming. And there's a, um, there's an adaptation of a speculative fiction by a you know, Nigerian American author that I'm working on is a short story. Um, and um, it happens to span like Wild Seed span both um, both Ni uh, Nigeria as the case turns out to be and America, um, except it's 50 years in the future. Um, and I think at this, you know, for, uh, you know, when you're, when you're still, when you're trying to put together a film project, um, the, the concerns and challenges are very different from, you know, uh, when there's a complete film and you have to figure out, you know, how you, how you sell it or how you market it. Um, because the main decision makers are, you know, investors and then film folks, you know, studios and, um, you know, the, the streaming platform. So it's a very, it's a much narrower view and, and you'll find in many cases, you know, uh, you're dealing with people who are not familiar with, you know, like you talk with people and you say, well, Octavia Butler or um, Tanana Reeve do, and there's like blank looks on their face. And that's not to say that they aren't well-read people within the movie industry. It's just, you can't assume that people have that familiarity with what you're talking about, you know. So drawing a line as an example between this project, which is um, messenger RNA um, and, you know, drawing the lines between Wild Seed and, um, you know, uh, Tanari Dew's African Immortals series and this, you know, like half the time people are just, you know, like they're just glazed over and all they want, you know, just sort of like, tell us what this story is about. And we don't really care about the broader context of, um, you know, how how these you know, areas have evolved. And then you just learn to roll with the punches. Once in a while, you get somebody who's really into it and has read, you know, uh, is read and is familiar with the stuff. And then you go deeper. And on other points, you just, you know, keep um, keep the big picture, which is, you know, here's, you know, expanding the idea of what diversity is, you know, exp expanding the range of things that um, a very, you know, like if you're working in the English language globally, the United States is, you know, the behemoth in it. And, and a lot of what gets made and how it gets distributed ends up going through that American lens. And then that affects, you know, what does get made. So. Um, the distinction isn't one in practice that I've had to deal with uh, at length, uh, but I, again, I think that just has to do with the gestation process for creating film and television. 
Um, I may have a very different question by the time these things are coming to market and uh, people start to react in, in different ways to it, audiences. We have a few questions. Tara is going to read them. <laughs> okay, so one of the questions um, is, speaking of Nedi's Twitter, can we talk about the beautiful creatures she shares? I love them. And I'm, I know exactly what this person is talking about. Um, could you talk to us a bit about not just the creatures, but I guess also your interest in science as well and how that re might relate to them? Yes, yes. Um, ah, thank you for that. I, I'm glad because <laughs> whenever I tweet those things, I'm wondering, like, am I just horrifying a whole bunch of people right now? Um, and then I do it anyway. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, since since I was little, like, I mean, since I can remember, I've always, always just loved creatures. Um, I thought I was going to be an entomologist before I became a writer. Uh, I, you know, I was known as the bug girl in my, in my neighborhood because I was always in the bushes catching things and I would catch and then I wish I had a, a cell phone back then because I would have been taking so many pictures. I would have had a whole library, digital library of pictures. Um, but, you know, I'd catch them and I would analyze them and stare at them and then I'd release them. So that was always um, that was what I spent all of my time doing, like on the weekend when I wasn't on the tennis court or the track, I was in the bushes or not, the, or the library, I was in the bushes, you know, researching these things and, and, and I would read about them and all of that. So I'm like a walking encyclopedia about bugs in particular. So uh, bugs and birds, I, I just, I just love both of those. Um, but I have like this obsession with uh, also small creatures. Uh, so, so like insects, of course, and just this idea of when you look at a swath of, of uh, vegetation, you know so much is going on in there, so much, and you don't see it unless you look very, very closely. And I love that, that idea of looking closely and seeing so much and the earth being so alive. I'm just obsessed with that. But also even on the, the um, microscopic, on the microscopic level, as well, you know, I was obsessed with microscopic organisms and just what goes on at this at this tiny, tiny level. So much goes on. I had a microscope and I would I would always look at in particular pond water. And if you look at just just a drop of pond water um, under a, even the, the most uh, rudimentary microscope, you will see worlds. You will see worlds, and it always reminded me of the of the sky. And like this, just to bring it back to this whole science fiction aspect, there's you know I'd be obsessed with pond water, looking at all the things that are happening in the pond water, and and classifying it, and 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 figuring out what's what. You know, is that an amoeba, a rotifer, a paramecium, all of that. And then there's one time when we were flying over um, on the way to Nigeria, where Usually when we flew over, yeah, when we fly over the Sahara, it's either night or day. And there was just one time when, when it was night. And when you're over the Sahara, there is nothing there, absolutely nothing. So you see, you finally see the sky. And I remember seeing the sky this one night and it looked like, it reminded me of a drop of water from the, from the pond because there were shooting stars everywhere. Like there was motion in the sky and, and the shooting stars were different colors and you would see the planets very clear, like you'd see everything very clearly. So, you know, that kind of thing, that's what, how my mind's working. <laughs> you know, when, when, so I collect all these images of these, these different creatures because I'm just obsessed with just the plethora of, of life that we have on this earth is just amazing. You know, even in a small area, so yeah, that's that's where that's coming from, and it's it never it doesn't stop for me. I'm always like that, and I only post I only tweet like one one out of the fifty pictures that I have stopped on in that day. So yeah, I I, I have restraint, but trust me, there's a lot more where those come from. <laughs> Amazing. Um, <laughs> I. Second question for you that's in the q and is from Cecilia. Um, Cecilia wants to know how Nye Song's character was developed and if you could talk to us a bit about that. 
Yeah, Oni Songwu. Okay, so Oni Songwu, the, I started writing Who Fears Death when my father passed. And my father's passing was very difficult for our family. My father was a cardiovascular surgeon, hardworking. He was chief of surgery here in Chicago. He had so many stories of saving people's lives. And what he eventually passed from was Parkinson's, which makes your hands shake. So think about a, a surgeon with shaking hands is a nightmare um, and congestive heart failure. So, you know, when, when he passed, I was very angry. I was a lot of things. And um, the day of his weight keeping, because I just, yeah. The day of his weight keeping, I had this experience and I started writing Who Fears Death that night. And I had no, I didn't know who she was. I didn't know who, like, I didn't know anything about the story. I just started writing. And, and that the very thing that I wrote is the, first is the first chapter of the book. It's when you've got this girl looking down at her father's, um, her, her father's body and thinking that's not him anymore. He's gone elsewhere. That was like, it's word for word up until the point where some things start happening. So that was like where the voice, like her voice came to me. It was that evening when I started hearing Oni Sonwu's voice. And so over time, like by the time I wrote Who Fears Death, I was ready to um, relax and, and let the characters step forward. Because there are a lot of things that Oni Sonwu eventually does in that story that I did not want her to do. And that she did as I was writing it. I was thinking it was going this way and then it went that way. As I was writing it, it was absolutely shocking. But like um, her character definitely... Um, I, I don't know if it was developed or I just got to know her as I was writing her. And she got more intense and clear the more, the more I wrote. Who Fears Death took me, um, that book took me six years to write. That one took me longer because on average my books take me four. That one took me six and there was a, there was a reason for that. But there is a whole, there's a lot behind uh, her character, I had, to, I had to gradually get to know her, but her coming to me was after a very intense moment. And, and so I understand also it's your first, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's your first adult novel, right? Because you also write um, for, uh, you know, for other ages. Uh, yeah, right? it was my first published adult novel. The first okay. adult novel that I wrote was um, it was called The Legend of Arroyo, and it it's it's still unpublished, and it's a book that I had I have mined so many short stories from from that from that book. But yeah, I, the first the first novel that I wrote was young adult. The next one was adult. Mm -hmm. So I've always kind of I've done both. It's always been both. It's like it's um it's I don't think about that when I'm writing the story. It just comes the way it comes. It just, yeah, it just comes the way it comes. I would like also to follow up with um, a question and also to remind our audience that, you know, feel free to enter your question in the Q&A or the chat uh, function. Um, so um, in my class, uh, we just finished reading and discussing um, who fears death and my students are here. Um, and so one of the question that emerge is that of the um, heteronormativity of you know, who fears death, right? So the question is actually, why is the novel so beholden to gender norm and gender binaries? Um, if the novel is about, you know, it's African futurism, it's about imagining new possibilities and new worlds, right? Why don't you take it um, a step further and then unravel or deconstruct the gender? Yeah, okay, so Who Fears Death was written, like when, when I wrote it, I was, uh, first of all, that was written in 2010, right? Um, so there's that, you know, we develop as writers over time. So there's that. But also one thing about Who Fears Death that I was definitely playing with and commenting on and digging into was patriarchy, was patriarchy. Like the way it's structured, the character of Aro, Aro is very a very complex um, character. He could easily be read as two-dimensional 
because of the way, you know, because of some aspects of his personality that are very difficult. But, um, you know, as playing with patriarchy and this idea of w strong, strong women navigating, navigating patriarchy and becoming what they needed to become despite patriarchy. That was something I was really, really interested in because I've, I've grown up watching, I've grown up watching that. I've grown up watching um, the women in my family. Na they're very strong, but they navigate patriarchy in this way that, that I, as a, a Nigerian American, have a very hard time with very hard time like i can't it was actually very difficult for me to write so i was i was dealing with that the the structure was 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 intentional it's a reflection of the the existing patriarchy i just took that took that structure into the future and kind of tweaked a few things about it like the female genital mutilation is more complex because it's in the future um so so we've got this very structured patriarchal society uh and, and gender fluidity definitely existed in that world. It just wasn't the highlight of the, it wasn't highlighted in the, in the narrative. It wasn't, not directly. If I wrote that, if I wrote Who Fears Death now, I think there would be some things that I would have, that I would highlight, you know, and you, you see it in the, in the Binti series, I'm kind of playing a lot with, with um, gender fluidity, but in Who Fears Death, um, you know, I, I think that like, we, I think that we, we need to look at when I wrote that and, and, um, and the fact that when Who Fears Death came out, boy, there was like, it, it was already uh, like writing African Futurism in 2010, having that published in 2010 was a strange thing. Like, I, you know, and those are things that were said to me when it was, when, when, when uh, production companies looked at Who Fears Death you know, what we were told back then in 2010 was we don't do that. We don't do African science fiction, like those exact words, big, very known production companies where if I said their names, your mind would be blown. Um, so we're, so we're dealing with that, but like, in, so, but, but in terms of gender fluidity, I think that, yeah, if I wrote that now that I would have brought forth, brought forth some other things. I, you know, I don't think in 2010 that I was ready, that I was quite there yet. So, um, Muktara and Iyabo, let's go on with the questions. I think we have four questions. Muktara or Iyabo, would you like to read them? For the adaptation of Wild Seed, mm -hmm. how are you approaching the balance of staying true to Butler's original work while drawing from your own experience to reimagine the story for the 21st century from an anonymous attendee? Yeah, there. Um... I can't give too many details, though I'd love to. I can't wait till we can discuss this. Oh my gosh. But like, I would say that there's plenty of room for both, for all of that. And of course, um, <clears throat> when Nuri and I, we're both, you know, we both love the book already. We both love Octavia. Um, so there's that. And then Octavia's um, estate is deeply involved. So Octavia's estate is very, cautious about who they will even allow to option her work. Like you, you can't even like, we had to prove ourselves to them before we could go out and pitch Wild Seed to, um, to streamers and, and we, we couldn't even do that. We had to prove that we were worthy. So like we, we were properly vetted already because they were like, you know, we don't want anyone who is not going to stay true to Octavia's, uh, Octavia's work and vision. Not that the story can't be adapted because adapting is, you know, the story always changes. Adapting something from book to film or TV series means it's going to change. Like that, they are two different storytelling mediums. That is a fact. So uh, that's not what they were saying, but they said you need to keep this, the soul of this needs to be alive. Um, and, and, you know, we, we want to know what, what it is that you plan on doing before we can even pitch the thing. So we had to do a lot of work before we could even do that. So, so, so there's that. And, they're, and they've remained highly involved, not just in that initial process, but throughout. They see drafts. Like, they see, the, like, we're working on the uh, second episode now. They see the treatment for that. You know, and then they give their feedback or or their praise, and that we're always happy when they give their praise. <laughs> they're like, Octavia would love this, but yeah. So they're they're very so we have that element 
that, you know, keeping us in check, but also we have, we, you know, we keep ourselves in check. We know that we're adapting the, um, this really, really special work, but there's also plenty of room for us to add our own spin on things too, because, you know, it's a TV series. So TV series make things expand, you know, so there's going to be, I'll stop because now this is, this is where I can, yeah. There's so much. It's gonna be so good. <laughs> so, it's gonna be so good. Our next question in the Q and A is from Hamza. Uh, Hamza writes, uh, "Really interested to know whether Nadi believes the voices she hears are from her own mind, or whether she entertains the idea that they could be from entities outside of her." I believe that sometimes that they are entities from outside of myself. I'm not just talking to myself. And I feel, you know, um, I, I don't just believe that I know it. There are times where like, it's just when I'm writing, I'm just sitting back telling the story that something else is, is telling me. And it's easy. Those times are easy. And like, I'll write it and then I'll come back and read it. And I don't even remember writing that. And um, I'll be like, oh man, this is good. I'm really enjoying this. <laughs> it's just like reading it for the first time. I mean, and I know that sounds crazy to some people. That's okay. Um, but it is what it is. So question for Dio. Um, what are some of the opportunities and challenges that, are, that you're facing trying to bring forth um, African cinema to a wider audience? Um, yeah. Let me take a narrow interpretation on that. Um, I think, you know, one, one, one interesting thing about um, early African literature um, as published in the, you know, from, I guess, starting with Things Fall Apart and, and, and going on was that a good amount of it was widely read on the continent and um, with African film, it's the odd, it's frequently in the odd situation that um, some of the most brilliant African films in African cinema have not been widely seen in their home countries or on the continent in general. And, um, you know, with, with, with literature and with film, you're constantly trying to figure out who the audience is and that, that feeds into what gets greenlit and what gets financed and what gets made. And for me, I guess one of the biggest challenges is, is making sure that um, with the projects we work on, that there is an opportunity for um, the, you know, whether it's a film or TV, TV uh, production, that there's a possibility and there's a pathway for it to be seen very widely on the continent itself. Um, as, the streaming platforms have risen, it's become easier to reach, um, you know, uh, folks in the diaspora, uh, whether those are, you know, recent, uh, recent immigrants or people who left in the Middle Passage. Um, but, you know, so it's, it's easier, you know, sort of like, well, if this is gonna end up on Netflix, then people in, in, in North America are gonna see it, people in Asia and Europe are gonna see it. But the truth is, you know, um, Netflix has something like, you know, has well under half a million subscribers in the entire African continent. So you have a billion people, you have a half a million to a million subscribers who see, you know, who's seeing things. And how does that then affect what you create? Because you're creating something that you know is going to really only be seen by, you know, people outside Africa, then, you know, um, it, it changes, it changes, it, it, it has an impact on some of the choices. So um, I would say that in the process, particularly with some of the production partners that we have who are, you know, based in the US or the UK, emphasizing that even, you know, that we're creating something that's going to last hopefully forever. And that even if, this year or next year, the African audiences may not see it. 10 years from now, that may very, be very different and how are they going to receive it? How are they going to understand it? Um, and and um, you know, something that's very difficult um, in the process of 
you know, when, you, when you're raising financing and developing a project, you're getting, you know, there's, there's this constant conversation back and forth. Um, and it's hard to hold the line because, um, you know, the, the balance of power is not always, uh, it's not always even. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I would say that that's one of the, the big challenges is, is looking to present and future um, audiences and where on the globe those audiences may sit. Thank you. So we have two questions in the Q&A box um, for Nedi. The first one is from Stavros. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Um, and it says, I was struck by the idea that a dogmatic, widely accepted text like the great book could be rewritten. Was this a conscious connection to the story of unwriting um, harmful singular narratives in post-colonial African literature? Um, the great book, I think, I mean, on one level, yes, but on another level, I was thinking about the Bible and how it's been rewritten. <laughs> so like several times. And I was also thinking about the, the Quran and how um, many say it hasn't been rewritten. So I was thinking about those great books and their impacts and how they're often tweaked to serve uh, to, they're, they're tweaked to serve um, different agendas. And then I was also thinking about how they are um, mystical objects and how they have a power and how you know, I was just thinking about just, just thinking about the power of these these um, these books, and then I was also thinking about uh, about other mystical texts and um, how they're lost. You know, so it it was mainly that was more the standpoint that I was I was thinking about mystical texts. I was thinking about um, the oral tradition versus the written tradition and which is given more weight. Um, and, and even in the way that Who Fears Death is told, it's told she's telling the story. It's being recorded into a laptop. But can you, can, can you, you know, I was playing with this idea, can someone really sit down and tell a whole novel, speak a whole novel, you know? Um, so I was playing with that there. So there are many, just many levels of things that I, that I was playing with, with the written word, the mystical word, um, the power of narrative, the power of writing something down. Um, and then, uh, God, where is it? oh yeah, and then this is the last thing, it's, it's not as deep, but Lawrence of Arabia, there's a character who always says, um, it, it is written, you know, it, it, is it, it's been, it's either, it's been written or it's been spoken, like one of those who always says that. And, and Lawrence retells what, so, you know, yeah, I love Lawrence of Arabia as well. So that's like another, I was, I was working that in, but like just this whole idea of the oral versus the written word in the, and, and, and the power of both the oral and the, and the written words. I, 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 I am very much a, a, a storyteller um, of the written word, but I come from, you know, my, my, my father was like a, just a natural storyteller. My uncle was a natural storyteller. The very first Stephen King book I ever knew of was the, it was the, the story was told to me. It was Cujo by my uncle in the basement. He'd read Cujo on his flight from Nigeria to visit us in the United States. And he sat us down in the most traditional way and told us the story of Cujo. And that was the first Stephen King book I read. So it's like, and it stays with me. And when I finally read the book, it was the exact same. It was like the exact same. So like, it's, it's a lot of, um, I was kind of poking at all of those ideas, which probably wasn't what you were expecting to hear, but that's what it was. <laughs> awesome. Uh, the second question is from John who asks, um, also about who fears death. Mm -hmm. And John says, Nedi, I wanted to ask about how in Who Fears Death, various events and characters reflect aspects of your own life. In the context of your discussion of time in the novel earlier, I was wondering if there was a broader purpose 
to inserting details from your life into a world that combines the past, present, and future? Um, I mean, I can't, like, only so isn't me. It's definitely not me. I mean, every writer's um, characters has maybe a bit of them in them. So I, I think one thing that you could say um, that, that I took from myself for Oni Soma was her rage. Um, there is a fight that she gets into when they're on the, when they're on the move, when they're traveling. And um, she was like, it was either, was it? It was DT, where she fights with DT and she's slapping her, <laughs> just slapping. I have really big hands. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things you don't want from me is you do not want to be slapped by me. <laughs> and I used to fight a lot when I, from the age of uh, zero to 12, you know, I kind of got a clue that fighting was a bad thing by the, by the time I was 12, but like, um, yeah, I enjoyed fighting. There's something in me that enjoyed fighting. And so like, I was pulling from that when I wrote that scene where she just slapping her, cause I've done that to somebody before when I was a kid. Um, so, I, you know, so there are moments like that where I was, where I was drawing from personal experience. Um, also uh, the, you know, I'm, the Biafran war, the, the, um, the, the civil war in Nigeria, um, you know, that ghost hangs over every, every, um, Nigerian family, you know, to this day, we all hear stories and there are stories, <clears throat> there are stories that, that I've grown up hearing and I use details of that in, in Who Fears Death. So there are like all these little things, but like in terms of, um, in terms of like the greater part of the story, I wouldn't say that, you know, I, I definitely wasn't, wasn't writing about myself, but like, you know, every single every narrative that any writer tells, they're gonna be aspects of, of the personal in there that are woven and that, or that you're drawing from in order to properly experience uh, what a character is doing or feeling or saying or whatever, yeah. So interesting because writers distinctly always talk about how they are kind of in the presence of entities when they're writing, Toni Morrison mentions it as well. Yeah. Yep. I just want to pivot back to um, Dio and ask, how do you how do you choose which projects to become involved with? Because filmmaking is a long process, as you said, and it requires a lot of passion. So, what are some of the the reasons that you end up getting involved um, with a project? Um, it 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 probably that's the answers to those are probably as wide as uh, the projects themselves. Um, uh, as you said, um, not all aspects of filmmaking are, um, are, are collaborative. The, the, the early days of a project can be um, as, as intense uh, a solo uh, experience if you are as if you are a creative if you're a creative producer and are deciding you know that you want to tell the story, especially if you are a writer as well, or if you're a writer director as well. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's uh, definitely a more collaborative um, field of, of creation than, um, than uh, writing in general. Um, and some of the things just, you know, um, it's as simple as somebody approaches you and says, hey, I wanna do this, uh, I need help with ABC um sometimes it's you have an idea and find people who would work well um have either done work or you've seen something that they've done that you, makes you think that um it'll, it'll it'll be a good team and um yeah so it's it's it varies from wanting to tell your own very deeply personal stories to um, seeing people, you know, people approaching you with um, to collaborate on on stories that that they want to see um, told. Uh, but for me, I think it just boils down to, um, you know, film, music, and books have been things that have, you know, been with me through my life um, from, you know, 
growing up in Nigeria to moving to the States as a teenager to moving back to Nigeria and other African countries as a, you know, as an adult. And, you know, um, I guess seeing things that reflect the changing perspectives that, that, that um, time, time and place have to offer um, around, um, ar around the narratives that, that you witness um, and then feeling that there's something important or relevant that the world, you know, to tell the world about what you've seen. Thank you. So thank you so much, Dayo. So we are about to um, outro. We still have a number of questions coming in, but unfortunately we have time for just one last question. Um, and this is a question that is coming from students in my class. And it's about um, how Nedi, you chose to portray trauma in Who Fears Death, right? And how you and Wanuri plan to incorporate your seemingly different strategies for the portrayal of trauma. Um, so the question talks about the centering of joy in Wanuri's work versus the creation of space for joy to exist within traumatic context um, in your own world, in your own, you know, in your own text and then in Wild Seed. Yeah, um, in turn, okay, so uh, when Nuri can, could probably speak better to like how to portray that, you know, cinematically, um, that's something we've been, we've been discussing a lot. That's something that's definitely gonna, gonna come up with uh, in Wild Seed. It will definitely come up in the HBO adaptation for Who Fears Death. I think that was, that was on the table for discussion in like the first meeting for Who Fears Death. Like that's, that's something everyone's very nervous about. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm very much, um, very much, of a believer in Afro bubblegum, like very much like that is something that is a standpoint, like when Uri and I just, we have the same philosophy on so many things. Like it just, it just, it just goes through like everything that, everything that we do, we're just moving in the same, in the same direction. Um, Who Fears Death was a dark, a, a dark story, um, a dark book. Um, I, I wrote it at a dark time. And when I wrote it, I didn't hold, that was the first, first thing I've ever written where I did not hold back. Like where I knew I'm like, this is, uh, this is going really far, but I'm going to write this because it needs to be written and to, to shy away from it is to disrespect what happened. And this is like a story that's set in the future, but I still say what happened. Um, and in particular, the the two the two big scenes in Who Fears Death. There's the the scene with um, with uh, Onisomu's mother Najiba. That that scene was almost word for word. I, I found an account from a, a a Sudanese woman who was talking about her encounter with the Janjaweed, who were the men on horses. And it was, and, I, and whenever I would research that, I was always looking for women's voices, just like with the Chibot girls. I don't wanna read about other people's interpretations of what happened or what they went through. I was always looking for their voices, even though it will be, you know, those things will be difficult because, you know, a lot of them, they don't wanna talk about that. But oftentimes there's one who's in there who's like, I'm going to tell this story. You know, it really depends on the personality. And so I had found one of those women for the this Sudanese woman who told like word for word, bluntly, graphically, what happened. And I remember reading it. I remember having nightmares from it. I remember feeling sick. And then I remember putting that right in Who Fears Death. So Who Fears Death reads like that because it's real. Like it, it, it was real. And it was, a, it was um, and I knew like I needed to, I needed that to be what it was. I couldn't like pulling back from it, um, pulling back from it would have been a disservice to, to what was happening. Uh, and, and, the, and the same with the, um, the uh, female genital mutilation 
part aspects of it. Like I, I know people who had it done to them. Um, they've described it to me. Uh, they've described how they've lived with like all of that. So, uh, you know, those things were, went directly into this, this book that is considered science fiction fantasy. You know, that's why I dispute that idea of saying they're not realism because it really depends on what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but the balance of joy, you know, was also important. That is something that I learned from my parents, from my family, when they talked about um, hard, some of the hardships that they've been through, um, especially when they talked about the Biafran war, especially they talked about times where they were, it was, it was difficult and disturbing. I have stories of, of, of family members who had to flee the North because my mom was born and raised in the North where they were massacring Igbos in particular. And so I have stories of that, but like when they talk about it, they, they, they talk about the dark, but they also talk about times of happiness and joy within that, within that. So like I made sure like in Who Fears Death, that was always the point of view that I came from, that, that I came at it from. Like this goes, this goes really dark, but these are people, they're living, they, they're, there will be laughter even in that. And so that's, and, and that's an attitude that, you know, Winuri had, like that's where Winuri's Afro bubblegum comes from. Like it, it's really rooted in that. And then it, come, it kind of grows from that. But it's also something that Winuri and I both feel we're gonna bring strongly to um, all of the projects that we work on. But like with Wild Seed, it will, it will be something that we have to be aware of too, because Wild Seed goes dark. Wild Seed goes really, oh man, <laughs> you know? So, so that, balance, um, that balance will be very necessary. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we wanted to acknowledge that we have other questions in the audience, from the audience, including question for Dio, but it's two o'clock. And it seems like Nedi's last words are a good place to end um, this conversation uh, on you know, what it means um, to narrate uh, Black futures. Um, thank you again for joining us. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have been able to work on this with uh, my co-conspirators, Murtara um, and Iabo, Nedi, Dayo, and uh, Wanuri. Thank you again for accepting our invitations, you know, very quickly, as soon as I sent the email, you responded. It's been a joy working with you and we look forward to welcoming you to our campus when we are back face to face. We'll bring you back for a long time to Dartmouth College, I promise. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for Pleasure. Having me. Thank, Thank you so much, yeah. <laughs>